You know, the angels began the gospel by singing joy to the Lord. Jesus has come. And in Revelations, it ends when they're standing before the throne and they're singing a new song that no man and no angel has ever sung. And they're singing praise and worthy is the Lamb of God. Our gospel begins with a song. It ends with a song. It is a gospel of joy and a gospel of peace. Psalm chapter 5, the fifth Psalm, read verse 11 and 12. Praise the Lord. Verse 11 and 12. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, wilt thou compass him as like a shield. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, bless the reading of your word. Lord, speak to our heart this morning. Lord, let us live with joy in our hearts and a song upon our lips. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It is God's intent and his desire for you to live in victory. It is his desire for you to live in victory. God has destined that each and every one of you would be more than conqueror through Christ. That you would not be bound, but you would be free in Christ. God has designed you, your life, to be a person of great joy. He really has. The joy begins at the cross. When we meet Jesus we find the source of joy. In John chapter 15, verse 11, <clears throat> John chapter 15, verse 11, he says that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. We're the, we, do you not realize we're the mighty marching army of the living God? Amen. Praise the Lord. We are more than conqueror through Christ who loved us and gave himself. We're the bride of Christ. How does a bride before the wedding? You know, I told the Sunday school class this morning about Jesus and the Jewish uh, wedding and how he would come and he would be betrothed what we would call married, but not really married, just engaged. And then he would go, he would say, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be with me. Does that sound familiar? And he would leave. And when he came back, a great parade of people with trumpets and sounds he was coming to get the bride to take her to be with him. That sounds familiar. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there ye may be also. And I'm coming back and I'm coming with a shout with the joy of the Lord and the bride should be the happiest person in the house. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We ought to live like it. We ought to think like it. 
We ought to talk like it. We ought to act like it because Jesus Christ is coming back for us. He's coming back for us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, what, you know, Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. It's your life force. It is your strength. It is who you are in the difficult times. What gives you the strength to go on? The joy of the Lord. The peace of God that passeth all understanding. The joy of the Lord. He said, Nehemiah said, don't weep. They were weeping because of the conditions of society. Any of you feel like weeping? <laughs> oh, my goodness. He said, don't weep. Don't mourn, for the joy of the Lord is your strength, and God will be with you. Without the joy of the Lord in your life, you will live a weak and defeated life. You cannot succeed spiritually in life without the joy of the Lord. Psalm 16 and 11 says, In thy presence is fullness of joy forevermore. It's fullness of joy. You see, the closer you get to God, the more real joy you're going to experience. Have you ever noticed that as people are getting further, further away, drifting away, they seem to have less joy? The people who are getting closer and closer and closer to God seem to be overflowing with the joy of the Lord in their life and in their heart. John 16, 24, he said, Ask and receive that your joy might be full. That it might be full. You know, the Pharisees, they accused Jesus of being entirely too happy. They said, He is too happy. He's going to all the weddings. He's in the forefront of the parties. He is, he's a wine bibber. He's this and that and the other. He's terrible. You know, Jesus was at the wedding. His first miracle was at the wedding of Cana. I don't believe, I can't go over there, but you know, I don't believe he was in a corner. Holy, holy. No, I believe he was dancing. I believe he was doing the traditional Jewish dance. And they had their hands on each other's shoulders. They were dancing around in a circle. I believe Mary came to him and said, Hey, Jesus. And he said, What? Jesus, what? I believe he was a, he was a part of the festivities. He was a part of the party. Has anybody said that about you lately? Are you way too happy to be a holy man, a holy woman? Are you bursting with the joy of the Lord and the life of Christ in your life? Are you loving God, loving others, and doing for others? Does the joy of the Lord bubble over? Well, first, let's go to the first, the history of the shout. Numbers Chapter 23, I don't think I gave this verse to him, but Balaam is a prophet. He's a diviner. He's a, a sorcerer. He's, he's a prophet. And Balak, the Canaanite king, sees what's happening. He sees Israel is defeating king after king after king, and he says, hey, I got I to gotta have something special. And he hires Balaam to come and put a curse on Israel. And he offers him lots of gold and silver and all kinds of stuff. And Balaam comes. And he, he comes to him. But in, in chapter 23 of Numbers, in, in verse 21, he comes back. He says, Balak, I can't curse them. I, I can't put a curse on them because 
they're serving the living God. And there is a shout of a king in the midst of the camp. Praise the Lord. Do you get it? There's a shout of a king in the midst of the camp. They're a covenant people. They know who they are. They know where they are. They know where they're going. And I cannot curse them because they are living for God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Psalm 47.1 says, clap your hands. Why do we clap in church? The Bible says to. It says, clap your hands. It says, clap your hands. Well, we don't do that in our church. Well, you're not in your church. You're in a Pentecostal church. Clap your hands. All ye people shout unto the Lord with a voice of victory. Amen. With a voice of victory. It's time for God's people to stand up and shout unto the Lord and say, Lord, we're shouting in victory because we know who we are. We know where we're going. We know what time it is. And it's a time to shout in victory unto the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. What about Joshua? Jericho was the largest city that he was going to face. It had some pretty big walls. It, had, it was an unbeatable foe. And Israel said, hey, could we, uh, could we go around that? Joshua said, no. He said, oh, we can't go around. Can we just ignore it? No. It's a great city. Impregnable. They could close up the walls and sit up on top and say, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. That's basically what they wanted to say. Hey, hey guys down there. You know what, you know what Joshua, you know what he did? Israel couldn't go around them. They had to conquer them. Many of you are facing a Jericho. Many of you are facing a Jericho in your life. It's something you can't go around it. You can't, you can't go over it. It's an unbeatable foe. It's something you must face yourself. You must face it yourself. Joshua. He got the people out there on the first day. They walked around once. Don't you know the people on the wall said, keep walking, guys. Keep walking. The next day, they go around. The third day, they keep going around. They, they say, man, these guys are getting their exercise, aren't they? Walking all the way around the city. But on the seventh day, at the seventh, I should have brought this. I meant to bring, you know, on the seventh day, they walked around it seven times. And at the end of the seventh time, somebody blew a shofar. I should have brought that in. Kim, can you blow a shofar? Wow. Somebody blew the shofar, and the people let out an enormous shout. You get that? They let out a shout of victory. And the walls came tumbling down because God's power was released in their lives. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Secondly, there's supernatural power. Supernatural warfare is fought when you shout for God. Look at Psalm. 149, verses beginning at verse 5. Look at this. He says, Psalm 149, verse 5. He says, the high praises of God. What is that? Anybody know what? Does that like you get it real high? No. 
the high praises is a loud, a loud shout unto the Lord. He said, the high praises of God shall be in their mouth, uh, and a sword uh, shall be with them. Let them sing aloud upon their beds uh, for the glory of God uh, that is upon them. Let a sword of vengeance as it kills the kings and the nobles uh, and all of them. I want you to see this. I want you to see that God will fight. How do, how do you fight kings? How do you fight nobles? How do we fight in our society in an election? You pray you believe, you fast, you hang on for God, and God said, I will bring down kingdoms, I will bring down nobles, I will bring down evil, I will do it because I am the Lord. The Lord, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. When you praise the Lord, when you praise God, the power of God is released on your behalf. You know it in Philippians and Philippi. Paul and Silas were in jail. They had every reason to be blues singers. They could have been the first country western. Oh, oh God, my dogs died. They beat me. My pickup truck's not working. It could have been the first blues song. But you know what? As they were put in stocks in the basement of the prison, they began to sing and worship God. They lifted their hands to the Lord, and the praises of God rang throughout the prison. And God said, we got to do something for these old boys. And he shook the prison. He shook every door, every bar loose. He shook their spirit stocks off of their hands and their feet uh, and they got up and they left that place with a praise on their lips and a convert and they said God is good uh, and God will do it. Amen. <laughs> praise the Lord. Medical science confirms number three that when you're joyful when you're joyful there is healing power released in your body. An enzyme is released in your brain, which brings you a sense of well-being and a sense of healing. Joy can heal you physically. The joy of the Lord can heal you physically. Proverbs 17, 22 says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Wait a minute. I don't want to see a show of hands, but how many are taking medicine? Why don't you take God's medicine? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. It, it touches you. It releases enzymes. Uh, it causes your body to heal. It is a great blessing. Uh, Proverbs 15, 13 says, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. A merry heart makes a cheerful counselor. Don't take a hundred pills. My mother, they, the doctor just prescribed and she said, my goodness, all these pills I've got to take. I said, take them for two weeks. Don't take a hundred pills. Choose joy. Choose joy. Choose life. Choose the power of God. Almost everybody gets depressed. Moses, Moses did. He came down the mountain and threw the tablets down and broke them. What caused him to do that? They had elected a new pastor while he was up on the mountain. That's enough to get anybody depressed. And they were having sex orgies and golden calves. 
And he said, what's going on? And he throws the tablets down. What about Job? Job said, it would be better for me that I had never been born. I sense depression in that statement. It was better for me that I'd never been born. Elijah said, Lord, I'm the only one left. Please take me home. I'm the only one left. He wasn't. But God said, sit down and let me nourish you and feed you and comfort you. You know, the Bible says, let no man take your joy from you. Let no man take your joy from you. Who? You. Don't let anybody do it. You have a choice. You have a choice. You can choose your attitude. What did Paul say? What did Paul say in Philippians? Rejoice. 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 And again, I say rejoice in the Lord. Where was he? Was he on the French Riviera with music playing, his feet propped up, sipping lemonade? No. He was in prison. They had no habeas corpus. He didn't know if he would ever get out. He was at the emperor's whim. But you know what he said? He said, rejoice. Rejoice. And again, I tell you to rejoice because what has happened to me has fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel and God's got everything under control. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Quickly, number four, Jesus is the source of our joy. He was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus was. The Feast of Tabernacles was a feast of joy. It was a feast of joy. The angels sang, We bring you good tidings of great joy. Oh, that's what they sang. Jesus said, My joy I give unto you. Can I tell you something? Write this down. Joy is not taught. It is caught. It's not taught. It's caught. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Oh, they want to tell you, well, if you're a Christian, you're not going to be joyful. Uh-uh. You know, the angels began the gospel by singing, Joy to the Lord, Jesus has come. And in Revelations, it ends when they're standing before the throne and they're singing a new song that no man and no angel has ever sung and they're singing praise and worthy is the Lamb of God. Our gospel begins with a song. It ends with a song. It is a gospel of joy and a gospel of peace. When Jesus is with you, you can walk through the fire, and the fire will not burn you. You can walk through the flood, the flood won't drown you. You can go into the lion's den, and you can come out saying, God has shut the mouth of the lions. You can go to the prison with Joseph, and you can be in charge of the whole prison because God is on your side. Praise the Lord. Let no man take your joy from you. Let no man take your joy from you. Joy is found, lastly, joy is found in living in God's will. It's found according to his purpose. Jesus said, I delight to do thy will, O God. I delight. Everything in the world, everything, both in heaven and in earth, is all prepared by God. It's made by God. It's made for God. And only God can satisfy the longing in your heart that is longing for God. You can try everything. You can try jobs, money, possessions, whatever you want. There's a God-shaped hole in your heart, and only God can fill it. 
and anything else will leave you hungry, will leave you looking and wondering. Serving God, serving God, surrendering your life to Jesus brings fullness and peace and joy. Surrendering your life to him. Joy is found in a right relationship with God. Let me remember this. See if I can say it. Sin will take you farther than you ever thought you would go. It will cost you more than you ever thought you will pay. And it will keep you longer than you ever thought you would stay. The last scripture, Proverbs 28, 1. Proverbs 28, 1. Says the righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no man pursues. Huh. The wicked flee when no man pursues. And let me close with this. The prodigal son, he must have been insane. Why do I say that? The Bible says, and when he came to himself, he, he was not himself. He must have been insane. He was, he was homeless. He had said, he came to his dad and said, Dad, give me my portion that belongs to me. All I got to say is, it's a good thing he didn't have my dad. Because my dad would have probably slapped me silly. And I'd be saying, uh, do what? He said, give me, give me all my inheritance. He went out and he blew it. And he was homeless. He was in the pig pen. He was eating the husk that the swine did eat. And he came to himself. And he came home. And the father ran to meet him. Put a new robe on him. A ring on his finger. He, he had a party. And you know what? The Bible says that they began to make merry. They began to laugh. They began to play the music and the band. And they were having a great time. Why? Because one sinner had come home. One sinner had come home. Amen. The angels rejoice over one sinner who's come home. Amen.